Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for joining. We're going to give it about a minute before we get started to allow people to get into the platform. So please stand by. I hope everybody's having a good morning or afternoon or evening. Thank you for joining. You still have a moment to top off that tea or coffee. Coffee. Are you coffee or tea, Cornelia? Mm. I'm a tea drinker. Yep. Um, I joke around that we are, we don't drink tea here. We are tea drinkers. We have probably 15 different loose leaf teas and um, yeah. And how about you, Saad? Are you coffee? You said coffee. Yeah, I mean, it depends. If I need something to really wake me up, it's going to be injecting coffee into my bloodstream. But most mornings, it's tea. So. Okay, good. All right. All right. So why don't we get started? And, and Saad, I think you have something to show us to get started with. Yes, absolutely. We're going to get right into the demo first. We're switching things around. So the demo, just for everybody on the call, we're, imagine that this is going to be five, 10 years in the future. You walk into a Macy's store. What would you see? What would be the experience that you as a shopper would have at a store? So I'm going to go back to my desktop and I'm going to go to a shopping assistant app. And what you'll notice is that it's going to be asking Hello. for. Hello, welcome to Macy's online shopping. I'm your virtual assistant here to help you find the perfect items. You can ask me about specific products, request recommendations based on your preferences, or inquire about our latest deals and promotions. How can I assist you today? Can you help me find a blue shirt for Vegas? Of course. Are you looking for a casual or formal blue shirt? And what size are you? I'm thinking maybe something casual and a medium slim, please. Great. We have a wide selection of casual blue shirts in a medium slim fit. Would you prefer a solid color or a pattern? Obviously, this will continue going on for some time, but the whole experience is about can the assistant or a robot or an Android that's at the at Macy's remember who I am and help me find the clothing item that I'm interested in? It might have memory and be able to remember the fact that I came in two weeks ago and I bought these dark denim jeans. Maybe it would recommend something that goes along with that. Maybe a nice pair of brown leather shoes. So this is potentially an experience that could be driven at the edge using obviously interactive experiences and AI technologies. Cornelia, back to you. Okay, excellent. Um, so let's move back into the slides. So thank you so much for that demo, Saad. And we are in fact going to explain what's going on behind the scenes with this. So um, uh, what I'd like to do is once again, welcome all of you uh, to our webinar here. Um, let me take just a moment to introduce myself. My name is Cornelia Davis. I am a technology fellow and the VP of product here at Spectro Cloud. Um, my history, um, my more recent history in the last 10 years or so is that I have been working in application platforms. Um, so I spent quite a bit of time at Pivotal. Um, I also worked in within Amazon AI um, on Alexa and also worked in the Kubernetes space, both across Pivotal and Weaveworks. Um, having spent more than a decade in the cloud native space, I also am the author of a book called Cloud Native Patterns, which is targeted at the application developer and architects. So Saad, can you tell our listeners uh, a little bit more about yourself? Yep, absolutely, everyone. Hi, everyone. Saad Malik. I'm the CTO and co-founder at Spectra Cloud. Um, I started my career also in distributed systems and enterprise software space at Cisco. Uh, but I joined Clicker Technologies in early 2010s as their chief architect. And Clicker's mission was to help organizations deploy virtual machines across various different data centers and also cloud technologies. 
Now, C Clicker got acquired by Cisco in 2016. And at Cisco, I became director of engineering, leading teams, not only for Clipper Cloud Center, but also looking at higher defined software networking solutions. Um, we also here also help our organizations and customers to modernize their applications moving towards containers. In 2019, along with other key executives of Clicker, we decided to found Spectra Cloud. And we essentially focused on how do we help organizations to re rein in the complexity of Kubernetes and help them manage it at scale. And, and uh, Cornel, do you want to switch the uh, slide where you do drive the PowerPoints? Um, yeah, I think I'm already, uh, am I not sharing my screen? I don't think so. If you want to try that again, please. Oh, I, I apologize. I, uh, I did think that I shared screen. What would a webinar be without a few technical difficulties, right? That makes it real. There you go. Looks good now. Look good now. And I'm going to go into full screen. And are you still seeing my slides? Yep, looks good to me. Okay, excellent. All right, so for our agenda today, um, we are going to talk about edge in general. We're going to talk about the opportunities and challenges with running um, any kind of workloads at the edge and how you manage both that infrastructure and the workloads themselves. Then we're gonna add AI to the mix because when you do that and you add AI to the mix, those edge challenges, which are significant on their own, get to be even broader. Um, we will also do a little bit of a deep dive into what AI looks like, kind of the topology, if you will, of AI. And then we're gonna introduce the palette edge AI capabilities that we announced um, just a little bit ago. So we'll go into the details of those. Cool, and maybe I'll kick it off by just talking about edge in general. Um, but to start off with, I mean, over the past two decades, we've seen major changes to where and how applications are being deployed. In the beginning, all applications were deployed in data centers. And while data centers served their purpose, they obviously were limited in terms of providing scalability and flexibility. Uh, public clouds really changed that with almost instant access to near unlimited capacity and with just a few clicks, you can spin up resources around anywhere you wanted to. But now we're entering a new frontier of edge computing. And especially as more and more data is being generated and need real-time processing, the cloud isn't enough. Uh, this is really where edge environments really come into play because they bring computation closer to where the data is. And obviously minimizes your latency and allows for immediate actions and as necessary. Obviously, because of all these benefits, we're seeing a rapid adoption of edge technologies and edge computing platforms across so many verticals, from your healthcare to manufacturing, calculus, and many more. And these organizations are harnessing edge computing to deliver real compelling use cases, from data processing to AI inferencing, even driving industrial automation and IoT. But obviously, we're seeing this great the capabilities, there are some set of challenges that have to be that Edge also brings in because Edge is not a cloud. You don't have, think about an Edge environment. You wouldn't expect your McDonald's store manager to be a skilled Linux admin or a Kubernetes administrator. They wouldn't have the experience for that. Uh, in many cases, Edge is also being deployed into remote locations where internet connectivity can be a challenge. So the solution is to be autonomous and be able to work on its own. Security, of course, remains paramount because these edge boxes are deployed in remote locations. You may not have physical security, so still being able to ensure that the software that is running in your boxes is trusted and the communication between other nodes or between other management systems is also secure. Um, and finally, because the sheer volume of deployments you're effectively now having, now having to manage the life cycle of hundreds to thousands of edge computing nodes and clusters. How do you pro properly manage the rollouts and backups and control across all these different environments? There's a lot of different challenges and so much so that edge computing, a Gartner believes that by 2025, 50% of solutions will fail 
if they don't have the proper strategy in place. So what are the requirements for a proper edge solution? Uh, first and foremost, I, even that McDonald's store manager deploying the system should be able to get it up and running. Literally all they have to do would be plugging in the power cable, plugging in the ethernet cable and everything should come up. The system needs to be fully orchestrated, everything from the operating systems to your orchestration layer, whether that be Kubernetes or something else, all the way to your applications, zero touch provisioning end to end. Now, whether the solution is deployed in an environment that has stable connectivity or it's being deployed deep inside some mining rig that has very limited connectivity or no connectivity, it should still be able to work on its own. And all the various operations, provisioning is relatively easy these days, but when it comes to updates and backup and RBAC, all these things should be able to be done remotely without needing any skilled personnel on prem. So these are some of the, just the requirements at a high level of what it would mean to have a, a robust edge solution. Okay, so that is already a fairly big challenge. And now, of course, we're going to add AI to the mix. I'm sure all of you have been very aware and are here today because you are realizing that you need to address AI um, and leverage AI in providing solutions to your customers. And so the first thing to start with is it's not just you and it's not just a hype thing that's happening. This is a real market. Gartner has done some of the analysis there. And you can see here that there's a number of different things on this hype cycle and a number of different AI related capabilities. But the one that we're focusing on here today is AI at the edge. And that's the thing that's boxed in the center there. And you can see that it's already kind of, it's on its way down to the trough of disillusionment, which means that we're starting to realize that there's real problems. It's not just all of the rainbows and unicorns of the things that we can do with AI, but now we're starting to really grapple with those challenges. Um, and of course, we're going to come out the other side. But one of the really interesting statistics is that Gartner's done the analysis and has said by 2027, so which is only about three years away, 65% of edge use cases, so the workloads that are running at the edge, well over half of those are going to involve some kind of artificial intelligence. Now, of course, you just heard from Saad that some of those edge use cases are maybe not even connected to the cloud. So, oh my gosh, ChatGPT, doesn't that run in the cloud? It does. And what we want to do is we want to figure out how to do AI at the edge in an effective way. Now, to also talk about, oh, and incidentally, I'm going to go back. You'll notice there that edge AI, once again, I want to emphasize that this is a category. So this is the market that we're going to be talking about. Now, in going through kind of the AI jargon, let's also talk very quickly about ML ops. So what is it? Simply put, it's DevOps for AI workloads. So you can see here that we've got the same cycle that we've seen for many years, if not over a decade, around DevOps. And it's about this cycle that is going to allow us to release things out into production frequently, release early and often is one of my mantras, be able to see how that is performing out in the production environments, take that observability and use it to cycle back onto the other side to evolve your product. Now, it's the same concept, but the challenges with AI workloads are a little bit different. And we'll talk about that as we progress through our presentation. The other thing is that I want to distinguish between AI apps and AI ops. These are terms that you're going to hear. Today, we're going to be spending most of our time talking about AI apps. So the applications that are running at the edge that involve some artificial intelligence. AI ops is a term that is used to refer to leveraging AI capabilities to help you in your IT and application operations. 
And there's a couple of QR codes and bit.ly's here that are going to, that are pointing you to a little bit more information that we have on that. So one concrete example is, we all know that Kubernetes is hard. So when something is going awry in your Kubernetes environment, you start looking at the logs and you see this wall of logs and it's saying things like, oh, there's a back off. What on earth does that mean? And what we can do is we can leverage these large language models or any other kind of AIs that are, are doing generative AI against content, against data that have been specifically trained against a data set that has Kubernetes. So you're using, for example, Kubernetes logs as the training set for these, these language models so that when something's going wrong, it can take a look at the logs and from those logs generate actual human language that starts to tell you about things like, oh, your system might be overloaded because we're seeing a back off, a, a loop that's happening. So for more info, that's all we're gonna talk about today on AI ops. You can take a look at some of those articles. One of my colleagues wrote a great article around something called Kate's GPT, which is an um, open source uh, project that's out there. But going back to AI apps then, let's start to crack that nut open a little bit. Let's look on the inside. What do we mean by an AI powered application? What do those things look like? Well, there's really two fundamental components that make up an AI application. So I love the demo that Saad did earlier because we're gonna be able to refer to that. So the interface that Saad had there, which was a voice-based interface, that user interface, that doesn't go straight into the AI. There's actually user interface components that he interacted with. And those are traditional application components. These are things like your web services. They might have UI elements. So there might be actually, if you're running this at a kiosk, for example, where somebody is entering an order at a retail restaurant, um, there might be UI elements. There's certainly going to be backend logic that's going to be doing some of that processing. There might be some stateful elements to your AI application, like a local database. These elements are often going to be packaged as containers, Helm charts, Kubernetes deployments, those types of things. And those are, when Saad was talking about the edge solutions earlier and being able to manage things like Kubernetes at the edge and the workloads that are running on Kubernetes at the edge, these are kind of the traditional workloads. Now, those traditional workloads are also often going to be the clients to the AI. And that's what we're seeing here on the right hand side. The AI is the thing that's going to be taking in some input. So for example, the, the um, MP, MP3 of Saad asking for a recommendation for some clothing that he's taking on a trip coming up. So it's going to take that input. It's going to do some kind of inference and give you some output. That's the simplest way that we can think about the AI. So in a very simple pictorial, your application architecture is going to look a little like this. You're going to have some traditional, probably containerized applications. You're going to have a database. And then you're going to have these AIs that are running. Now, this picture depicts multiple AIs because even in the example that Saad was showing here, and he's going to break that down in just a moment, even in that simple example, there were multiple AIs that were being leveraged. And I'll let, you, I'll let him break those down in just a second. So rarely will you only have a single inferencing or a single type of thing that you're doing. You're going to string together multiples of those. So don't worry. I know this is starting to look you know, a little overwhelming, like there are so many things that you have to manage here. The infrastructure that all this is going to run on, all of these components, how they link together. Well, yeah, we're going to come to the point where we're going to start to help you solve those problems. Now, that AI 
which I'm depicting as a super simple icon there. Those three things on the right-hand side that look a little bit like neurons in a brain, we're going to now break that AI down into a couple of different components. So there are two things, apologies, I just had a something pop up. I don't think it's showing up on the screen, so I think we're good. Um, that AI, actually, we're going to break it down into two components. You have surely heard an awful lot around the model. So you've heard, for example, that GPT 3.5 or GPT 4.0. These are models, and I'll explain that more in just a moment. And there's a whole host of other models out there. Llama is a model that was released by Meta, for example. And then there are a whole host of other open source models that are out there. And I'll come back to describing those models in just a moment. These models are the things that are created by taking a whole bunch of training data and processing that training data. And what that the, what training does is it's looking for patterns in that large body of content. So chat, um, the chat GPT, so the GPT models 3.5 and 4.0, we've all heard that it has taken the content of the web and it's used all of that text and it's done a whole bunch of pattern matching across that. The output of that training is a whole bunch of parameters. And so the model actually has those parameters and that's what you see listed there as it's sometimes also called weights. And those weights and a number of other things, so some metadata, some hyperparameters, which are, are parameters that kind of configure the model, vocabulary, which are the tokens. So is this an English model? Is it a Spanish model? Um, is it a an, another language model? So those are all the things that make up the model. Those are all inputs into something that actually has to turn the crank. And that's what we refer to as the inferencing engine. So the inferencing engine is really just something that's doing a whole bunch of matrix math. Those parameters, those weights that were generated by the training go into an inferencing engine, which is just a bunch of for loops. Um, it really, you can think of that simplified that way, is it's a bunch of for loops that are taking in those values and then just doing a whole bunch of calculations. And that's the inferencing engine. Now, just like there's a whole bunch of models out there, there's also many alternatives for the inferencing engine. And not only the inferencing engine, but there's these frameworks emerging that are helping you navigate that. So local AI is one, and I'll show you a QR code in a bitly in just a moment where you can get more information about local AI. It's an op open source project. Then there's other open source projects like KServe, which came out of the Kubeflow community, Selden, Bento ML, and many more. So these engines are Again, very much available. Now, the last thing that I wanna point out on this slide is what's interesting is the inferencing engine, relatively speaking, is actually a fairly small portion of the size. You hear about these large language models. Well, the inferencing engine, whether you are processing 7 billion or 175 billion parameters, the inferencing engine is just a bunch of for loops. It's relatively small in size. For example, there's a, an open source inferencing engine that's written in C++. That's about 7,500 lines of code, but the models are far bigger. And we'll talk, we'll come back to that size issue in just a moment. But the main takeaway here is that we've got many different models, many different inferencing engines. And now when we go back to this slide, Saad, I'll hand it back over to you. You can see how all of these pieces are starting to come together to form a complete AI-powered application. Yeah, th thank you, Cornelia. So just like Cornelia mentioned, even that very simple application that showed does have many components that are not AI, even though we call it an AI-specific application. So just looking at the various components on the right-hand side, there is an element of the UI that shows you know, the picture of the bot, it has a video of you, 
It also has the ability to record your voice is that MP MPEG-4, MP3 style capabilities. That piece of UI technology was built with the Next framework, which internally uses React for rendering things and showing all the data uh, on the DOM. Now that UI, right, as I'm talking to it, it records my MP3 voice, it will be talking to a backend system. That backend system is also a container, just like the UI, also built with the Next framework internally using Node.js. Now it does have some additional libraries that I use inside called OpenAI Edge, which helps me make requests to an OpenAI-like system, whether it's ChatGPT, OpenAI.com, or it's another inferencing engine that can take those OpenAI-style APIs. At the bottom, you see is this local AI inferencing engine, or it's a meta engine, because what it allows you to do is deploy these large language models. So local AI is an open source inferencing engine, generally runs GGML based uh, models, and it also allows you to have an open AI style APIs. So if you have existing tooling or UIs that you've built against ChatGPT, um, you're, give me one second, see, if you build this, it essentially allows you to, uh, it essentially allows you to interface with an open AI style APIs and still be able to work across many different models. Now, in this local AI, in this example that we are deployed, I have two models deployed. I have a whisper model, which is a speech recognition model that's been trained with over 680,000 hours of speech across many different languages. They do have these languages that are English specific models that are more, a little bit more fine tuned. Um, and so for this specific example, we're using whisper medium. This whisper is gonna allow us to help the transcription aspect. And then the other model that I have also deployed is Wizard LM. It's also an open source large language model that is based on Llama 2. And that is what allows that connect, that interactivity. Like, hey, I'm looking for a blue shirt. So being able to respond to, oh, what is the blue shirt you're interested in? Is it gonna be formal? Is it gonna be casual? That Wizard LM model helps with, with that aspect. Uh, if we were to take a look at an end-to-end -end example, so maybe click once, Cornelia, how is the actual transcription happening? So I said, can you please help me find a blue shirt? That is just raw MP3, MPEG-4. The assistant UI gets that actual blob of data. It sends it back to the backend, and the backend at this point is just a proxy to make that request down to that whisper model to do the transcription. The result of that inferencing, like Cornelia mentioned, that there's an input that goes into the model, the output comes out. The output from Whisper was the actual text itself, help me find a blue shirt. That text goes all the way back up to the UI, and then the UI will make the other request to say, hey, make this into an interactive chat. And so for people who are familiar with OpenAI APIs, it's great chat completion API is being called on the wizard LM model. And that's when it makes that interactive activity. Okay, great. Let me look at my model for when somebody's asking for a blue shirt, what can I ask it? Oh, I can ask it, um, tell me, do you want it to be formal or casual? That logic of that communication is in the wizard ML model. Now there are of course other aspects I'm not depicting here, like the speech, being able to take that text and we're changing it back into speech. All that's done in the UI app. But as a high level example, you can see the two models that I'm using for, for this one. Can yeah. you have any thoughts on this? Yeah. Super cool. Um, thank you so much for breaking that down. Now you heard Saad talk about large language models. So let's talk about size for just a minute. So I've already mentioned GPT several times and I also mentioned Llama as a model. So G GPT 3.5, Remember I said the model has these parameters or these weights? Well, GPT 3.5 has 175 billion parameters. Now, when you put that into a file size, or if you can also think of it as you have to load those parameters into memory, that's 700 gigabytes of data. Now, wait a minute, Saad, didn't you say that this can run at the edge? Well, of course. And so Llama, on the other hand, is a model 
that is about seven, they, there's two different versions, seven or 13 billion parameters, which gives a file size or a memory size of somewhere between three and a half and 20 gigabytes. So there are language models that can fit at the edge. GPT 3.5, not gonna run on your edge. But Llama is a model that's gonna run on the edge. And we'll talk in just a moment about some of the trade-offs that we can make and how we can leverage these smaller language models at the edge and still get really, really good results. There's a QR code there and a, a, a um, for you to take a look at another video that we've done where we went into lower level details into that local AI framework that Saad was talking about and leveraged in his um, previous application. So kind of summing up the ch both the challenges and the enablers of both the inferencing engine, which you see on the left-hand side, and the AI models on the right-hand side, is now if we want to start getting real, how do we actually deploy and manage these applications? Well, remember, there's lots of different inferencing engines. So how do we manage having different inferencing engines available in my runtime environments. How do we select the right inferencing engine to go with the model? So when you heard Saad talking about Whisper, that uses one inferencing engine and the other models like the GPT models, the OpenAI compatible models, those might use a different inferencing engine. So how do I match those things up? And it turns out there's technology that can do some of that either via configuration or via automation. Those are all components that you have to manage. And of course, you just like Saad talked about in the beginning, you need to maintain that consistently across hundreds or thousands of different nodes. The cool thing is that these inferencing engines are being now designed so that they don't require a GPU. You don't necessarily have to have a GPU on your edge location. And there's lots of inferencing engines out there. On the model side, you again are going to have multiple different models. You're going to have multiple versions of those models. And how do you keep all of that in sync? Um, you're going to be frequently changing those models because you're going to want to experiment whether this recommendation engine is better than this other recommendation engine. So you need that whole life cycle, the latter part of the ML ops life cycle where you're doing observability and using that data to feed back into the earlier stages. That's all things that are required at the runtime environment. You also have to have a registry where you can um, save all of those models so that you can, for example, roll back to an earlier version of a model. And again, consistency across those. I already talked about how smaller models exist that, and they work well in constrained environments. You can have a model that maybe isn't answering the question of what was what led to the fall of the Roman Empire, but it's really good at picking out a blue shirt at Macy's. Um, so those models can be smaller. There's also something called model quantization, which allows the rock star mathematicians out there have found ways of taking large models and actually changing the number of bits that those param that the parameters, the weights are, are, are using. Um, and they can do that without very much loss and fidelity, fidelity at all. And then the other cool thing is that because there's so many models available, you don't have to start your AI journey by doing a big training thing. So to sum up all of that, you are really responsible when you want to do AI at the edge, you have to solve this challenge of deploying and keeping track of all of these things across your landscape, not only Kubernetes, but the workloads, including AI components of those workloads. You have to, in many cases, you want to protect the data. So you don't want to send the queries that people are putting into your applications up into some third party that they can now leverage for their benefit. So you wanna have data privacy and sometimes there's even sovereignty where you're not allowed to send data out into, into the cloud. You need to be able to operate those things. You need to have that observability so that you can refine your, your, um, your applications. And then of course, you've got the whole management headache. It's not just about the initial deployment, but it's about day two as well.
So those are, oh my gosh, we just spent the last 25 or 30 minutes talking about these challenges, but we have some solutions. Yep, so we talk about challenges at the edge computing, which is generic. And then we also talked about challenges with running edge with specifically with AI. So I'll cover first the edge solution. We talked about the challenges that comes with connectivity, having limited skill sets and others. And this is where our solution palette edge really comes in and shines. It provides a comprehensive and cost viable capabilities to deploy and manage your Kubernetes at edge treating it just like any other location, whether it be your data centers or cloud. It provides a centralized and a scalable management across the entire stack, everything from your operating system to your Kubernetes, including all your add-ons and applications. And these applications could be your traditional applications, like Cornelia mentioned, those, those boxes, or potentially now also these new AI applications. Now, this pallet edge can be deployed onto a single very small server, whether it's x86 or ARM, it doesn't matter, to very, very large systems that could be full racks, even as much as that. The key here is being able to manage systems without requiring skilled ITs at locally. All management from upgrading your Kubernetes, your applications, even operating systems, are done remotely via policies. And you can very easily schedule to update all of your different locations across your West California before rolling it across to other parts of the US and then eventually the entire world. We realize that most applications today, people are looking towards cloud native and containers, but we still have a lot of legacy workloads that are under virtualization. So this platform is able to support both container workloads and VM workloads as well. Uh, and finally, I, I do want to mention that we have been working very closely with Intel to define a new architecture for Edge called Secure Edge Native Architecture. And it's our vision for how the industry is able to adopt a secure platform that does everything from onboarding to provisioning the entire stack and maintain security as your applications are running you know, for years and decades to come. Excellent. And so that is our, our um, uh, industry leading edge product. And what we have done now is we are extending that edge product um, with artificial intelligence. And it's exactly those things that we just drilled in on. We are helping you manage the life cycle of the infrastructure that is required to run applications. So specifically, those AI engines, those inferencing engines that we've been talking about, we will help you with the Palladate Edge AI product manage the life cycle of Llama or GPT models or any of those, you know, or I'm sorry, of not the, the model, I'm talking about the inferencing engine. We will help you manage that, the life cycle of those inferencing engines you're going to be, a, be able to address if there's any CVE, CVEs or patches that need to be applied to those inferencing engines. And that's probably going to happen on the cadence of, you know, maybe once a month or something like that. Then we are also providing the capability to manage the deployments and the, it, the frequent deployments of those AI models. Those might happen on a daily or a weekly basis. We will also be giving you the observability against those models and tying that back to a version, version controlled repository of AI models. We'll also be able to connect those things back to public repositories. So Hugging Face has a very, very sizable um, registry of the various AI models that are available in the open source. So we will have that available as well. So those are the capabilities that are coming in Palette Edge. Now, those capabilities, how will that work for you? Well, we have an element, we have a part of our product that is so central to everything that we do that we call a cluster profile. That cluster profile allows you to define all of the various layers of the things that are going to be deployed and managed out into your edge locations. That starts with the Kubernetes environment, the operating system, the way that networking works, any additional add-ons that come on top of that. 
including those AI engines and the models themselves. This is the way that we help you maintain that consistency across your entire edge landscape. So you create these cluster profiles, then they're deployed. If you version those cluster profiles, we will help roll those things out to the edge. So to um, summarize what is coming with the edge AI, is that in the initial release, we're gonna be focusing on that infrastructure component, the purple layer that you see here, the AI engines. We are going to have available, we're productizing the um, some of the frameworks, for example, the local AI framework that you saw in, in practice in Saad's example. Those things will be available. Um, we already have some, some uh, prototypes available in our community repository, but we are, going to be providing um, commercial support over those. So the initial release is focused on the infrastructure. And then the following release will be focusing on all of the things that you need to be able to manage the deployments of those models. So getting started, um, the, uh, uh, the a couple of things to sum up here is like any other project, crisply define your use cases and success criteria. One of the things that I wanna say is don't start with training your own models. If you don't already have a data science team that knows how to do all of that ML training, hopefully in this hour, you've heard that there's a lot of models that are available for you. Now you've probably also heard that you can fine tune models. That's probably also not the first step. If you're doing language models, Take a look at prompt engineering. There are ways that you can influence the results by the inputs that you put into an AI model. So for example, in the, the UI layers or the backend logic uh, that Saad was talking about, you can actually start to craft, put a little bit more context around the queries that are going into a language model that will refine the results that are coming back from those models. You, of course, have to anticipate the operational needs, infrastructure and workloads, and then release early and often. Get into the habit, start with this mindset that models are not static. You're constantly gonna be refining those. Um, by the way, on this notion of training your own models, I'm very interested to hear from you all. We're gonna put up a poll very quickly to hear how many of you are training models and already, and how many of you are looking to leverage existing models? Okay, so we'll let that um, the poll set up there for a moment. Um, and in closing, uh, I want to, I'm also going to put up here some bit.ly's where you can get more information. So learn more about the opportunities and challenges of AI. There's a blog post out there please join our Slack community. We have a Palette Edge, Edge AI. We have some Slack communities there where, where we'll talk to you. We'd love to talk to you more about your needs. And then we're also happy to do a one-on-one -on -one demo with you. So I'll leave that up there for just a couple of seconds, and then we will move over to questions. We'll also give you a chance to um, uh, respond to the poll. Um, I should also mention uh, that if you have any questions now, we're coming up to the Q&A portion. On the right-hand side of the platform, there's a little question mark icon. You can go in there and you can type in your questions. I apologize. I should have given you that orientation at the beginning of our presentation. I'll also mention that we've been recording this presentation and we will be making the recording available. So with that, I think we can move into the QA portion. Yep. So the first question, Cornelia, that came in is, um, I've always heard GPUs are needed for AI. Does that mean we need GPUs at the edge? No, not at all. So you can see, and I'm going to stop sharing so you can see our, 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 our dialogue here. Um, you don't need GPUs at the edge. You can have them, it's certainly possible. And I have seen edge locations that are not tiny. So it's not just the computer that's sitting underneath your you know, coffee shop uh, point of sale, you know, your register there. But I have been in large retail organizations where there's a server room in the back. 
and it actually has multiple racks. So GPUs are not precluded at the edge. You might have some, but they're not necessary because again, the, the language models can be um, smaller. And so they can run on commodity uh, commodity hardware. Okay, okay, awesome, awesome. And then the other question that came in right now is, uh, does edge AI only work at the edge? It seems what you're doing is valuable. Wouldn't it be valuable running in the data center as well? Ah, again, another good question. So yes, we are talking about this at the edge and all of those capabilities that we talked about are really valuable at the edge. And remember, we talked about the Gartner um, report that says, boy, an awful lot of the applications running at the edge are going to be artificial intelligence. And frankly, a lot of the AI is going to happen at the edge because there are so many more interactions that are happening. It's really kind of interesting because if you remember what we, we started with doing things in our own data centers on our own hardware, and then we've had this like transition up into the cloud. And now with these new use cases and frankly, the ability to have the hardware um, that runs well at the edge is allowing us to go back into these owning our own hardware and having those things. So yes, we're targeting um, serving that edge location, but there is no question that these same capabilities are valuable in the data center. The beautiful thing is that with um, the cluster profiles that I talked about just a bit ago, those cluster profiles aren't just something that we do at the edge. We do that in at on any infrastructure, any Kuber, any part of your Kubernetes estate, whether you're running it on-prem, you're running it on bare metal, you're running it up in the cloud, you're running it on edge locations. All of what we talked about here is applicable to any of those environments. And that's a great point of regarding being able to deploy in any environment. Those cluster profiles, there's a piece of it that is the Kubernetes layer there's also the piece that deals with the workloads, whether it's your traditional workloads that are containerized applications or the AI models you described, Cornelia. But there are, of course, those many integrations that go into your Kubernetes stack. Aspects like your logging, monitoring, security, ingress. There's so many different integrations needed to effectively run a application as well. And part of what Spectra Cloud does do is provide those out-of-the-box integrations for all the most common integrations that are available in the ecosystem. So that's where our value prop also comes in, being able to define that model, what do you want to deploy, and also providing those integrations so that's very easy for you to focus on just deploying your workloads on top. Yeah, awesome. Do we want to get into the polls? Um, so there's a, you asked a poll initially in the morning, right? Do you train your own models? And so the options that we had was, no, we do not have our own data or expertise to do training. The other option was we have data and are just starting to look at how to harness it to train. Or option three, we have a seasoned data science team who has been building production models for some time. And the responses are 75% say we do not have our own data or expertise with a quarter coming in and saying we have some data and are just starting to look at training the model. Interesting. So that was my instinct, Saad, was that yeah. the vast majority of us are not experts in machine learning. Um, but the cool thing is that you don't have to be to be able to start providing kind of AI powered value to your customers. Um, so very cool. And I had forgotten to let you all know, but my colleagues behind the scenes were really great about giving you the earlier poll, which is we also um, had a poll out there that says, where are you on your journey to deploying AI powered applications? The first one is researching technologies and just kind of brainstorming use cases. We know we need it, but we haven't started yet. Um, the second category was, yep, we've got some use cases and we're starting to do some proof of concepts. And then the third was we're actually running these things in production. And then the final one was we've been doing this for a long time. We've been doing AI powered applications for a long time. And the results of that one was a third, a third, a third, mm -hmm. and zero. 
So nobody's been doing this a long time. I think we're all in the same boat in this industry, with the exception of the few people who have been doing, you know, lots of, you know, like the Amazons and Facebook and Google that have been doing kind of AI powered stuff for a long time, especially us in the enterprise, we're really just getting started. And so we want to be here. We want to help you on that journey. And, and that's part of your lesson and your advice as well, right? I mean, leverage what already exists there today, right? Most of it will work as is. If you have to fine tune a little bit, those are vector databases you can add on top. You don't need to build your own model today. As you start experimenting and learning the experience that your customers are having, then you start making more optimizations. Yeah, yeah. All right. So I think that brings us to a close. Once again, I want to thank you all for joining us this morning or this afternoon or evening, wherever your time zone is. Um, we will be posting the recording of this. So um, if you have colleagues that you think might be interested in that, well, you'll be able to send them the link. Um, again, I would encourage you to join our Slack community. If you want to reach out to Saad or myself at any time, we would love to hear from you. Um, and if you want to see more about Pellet, please uh, let us know that as well, and we're happy to show you around. So, Saad, thanks so much for the great demo kicking us off and for the, the great presentation, and it's been just a pleasure working with you this morning. Likewise. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for joining, and uh, see you guys around.